possibility of uh, starting out, if I may, I'd, I'd like to, just to, for test purposes, make three controversial, provocative statements, emphasis. This is hypothetical. Uh, uh, and the first one would be that uh, there seems to be great arguments for uh, international participation, partnerships. Uh, from our partner standpoint, uh, if they are not on the critical path occasionally, they are fairly, fairly hollow partnerships. From our standpoint, we probably don't benefit that much if they're not occasionally on this critical path. Uh, we currently have such a situation where we have a partner on the critical path and everybody's all unhappy about it. Uh, it seems to me we can't have it both ways. A uh, second provocative statement, uh, uh, would the U.S. taxpayer have been so excited about paying for Apollo if Neil and Buzz had put a U.N. flag on the, uh, on the moon? And thirdly, uh, I'm now going to put aside geopolitics, which I've just been talking about here. Uh, talking about ISS, if one accepts that much of the science community believes it's, there's no value to continuing the ISS, and we put aside geopolitics, then presumably the only real reason for continuing the ISS would be uh, as a test bed. But a test bed for what? Uh, is it a test bed for the moon? Uh, the answer is probably no, because we know how to go to the moon. So it must be a test bed for Mars. But we've just said going to the moon is our test bed for Mars. And uh, if you don't commit to going to Mars, secondly, if you don't commit to going to Mars, does it make any sense to having a, a ISS test bed? So those are three provocative statements with a subset B of the third one. And you got 20, quest 20 words or less. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Um, which one of those do I want to wade, wade into first? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah I've, oh you I've, wrote them down. I wrote them okay. down. <laughs> Um, actually, so let me start with uh, Neil and Buzz planting the UN flag and uh, what would the public have thought about that. I'm going to just skirt what the public might have thought about it in uh, 1969 and just say that um, I don't pretend to be um, the uh, expert in geopolitics, nor do I, I want to be, and we've got uh, others on the panel who've got more experience than I do. But I would say that uh, we're in a different world and that um, – the world of the race to the moon was a, a world of competition. The world of today is much more a, a multipolar world. It's much more a world of, of uh, global cooperation. Um, it's been moving more and more towards that. And as I'm sure Les would, uh, would remind me if I didn't say it, it's really important that we align the space program. Um, whatever space program we come up with, we have to make sure that it's aligned to national needs, to what the United States believes is important to help it accomplish its broader goals. And um, I think it's, it's, you know, we all like designing rockets and we all like designing architectures, but at the end of the day, the space program um, is a national program and it, it really needs to, uh, needs to reflect what we as a country think is important uh, to us today. Um, and, and that having been said, I think that, uh, that, uh, that I'd like to, to dispense with um, the, the argument that, uh, um, you know, we should, we should go back to the idea of Apollo and, and uh, US, U.S. pride and U.S. go it alone and uh, be the leader in the space station and, and go to the moon and decide how to get there and invite some others to join us. I'd, I'd rather say that uh, the, the illustration and demonstration of leadership in today's world is more to forge an international partnership um, and to uh, use that partnership to, um, to, to promote a common goal. If, if I could add to, on that particular topic, this, this was a major theme of the recent National uh, Research Council study uh, about uh, the goals and rationales for our civil space programs. And, and sure, we talked about alignment uh, to national needs, but we also talked a lot about international cooperation. And we put it in the context of preeminence for our space program. Uh, and I think we all, particularly this subcommittee, agree 
that uh, maintaining preeminence for the United States is something that we do not want to give up. But preeminence does not mean dominate, and it doesn't mean dominance. And the sign today in this international global world of a good leader is not somebody who dominates something, but somebody who knows when to lead, when to follow, or when to get out of the way. Uh, and to be a good leader, you have to really be able to play all those three roles. And I think that becomes very, very important in uh, developing our further international partnerships and figuring out the roles that we will play vis-a-vis -vis other nations and the capabilities they can bring to the picture, even if it's on a critical path. Uh, and on that topic, critical path, I, I just have to take a lesson uh, from uh, my DOD experience and yours obviously also, Norm, uh, in sometimes getting cooperation in major programs, call it, for instance, an F-16 or, or something else. Uh, we look for partnership arrangements and we look for offsets. And those offsets don't always weigh in favor of a United States' uh, best industrial interests. But in the long run, they end up being good for the overall good of the nation, good of the total program. And that there may be a lesson learned we can look at in that context uh, for uh, the NASA space programs, too. And, and Norm, if I could add a couple of comments. First of all, I don't think the UN has a space agency. And um, so I'm not sure they can build a spacecraft. But uh, in a more general sense, there's now a, an increasing collection of uh, fairly competent space agencies around the world. And one can ask, uh, one can ask what together can we do that we might not be able to do uh, alone. And in that regard, I've heard a rather eloquent definition of soft power, which is uh, that the U.S., uh, through technical excellence and considerate behavior, uh, make people want to do what you want them to do. And so you, that's the way we can exert leadership, and I think it's possible to have national pride in the fact that we are uh, leading the fleet. Yeah, uh, I think I'd uh, <coughs> add one more thing on the, uh, the international discussion. It's been alluded to, but we, uh, we heard from all of the international partners about the values, the principal values that they thought of ISS was not the station itself, but was the, the uh, international framework, the partnership framework that has allowed um, you know, these five entities, 14 countries, to successfully collaborate through good times and bad for decades now. And that that is very unusual, and it's not something to be, uh, it's not something to be tossed out lightly. That it's a, a, an excellent, it's, a, it's an existing framework, it works well, um, and it's, it's something that we can use to build on in the future. You want us to go down your list, don't you? I, I do. I, I, I would emphasize I raise these because I think they ought to be on the record. And uh, mm -hmm. also, I think uh, that uh, Leroy had an important point that I, I would footnote that is that the ISS partnership is a wonderful foundation for a, a further exploration uh, international partnership, uh, a great place to build from. All right, ab absolutely, and, and the point uh, should also be underscored that not only uh, does it serve as a good foundation for future space exploration, uh, mm -hmm. but as Les and Sally have, have talked about, also for future uh, international cooperation in other areas as well. I think you asked, answered the first two, really, Sally, between you and your partners here. Why don't you do the third one? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, say, I'll just make one more comment. Um, avoiding the third one for as long as possible, okay. I'll, I'll make one more comment. Um, another from the international partners, and I think both, both Leroy and Charlie mentioned this, but, it, but it's worth highlighting. They all saw ISS as a potential path towards exploration. And each had a different, different perspective on that and a slightly different point of view and a different way that they'd implement it. But they saw ISS as their way of starting to get into exploration. That's not the way that we've been viewing ISS in this country, but it's important to know that that's the perspective that they've got. And so if ISS is extended, they'd like it to be its, you know, kind of, kind of its charter to be expanded to allow them to be thinking about that as they, as they go forward. 
which is why we thought that it's a it's actually a very natural framework to build from um, to to uh, form an international partnership around exploration should that be something that uh, that we wanted to lay out as one of the options or, or wanted to wanted to recommend Sally as an extension to ISS we could also consider redefining the model in the, in, in the relationship of you know our involvement in that partnership as well so I think that there's some opportunities there that say that we don't have to do it business exactly the way we've been doing business mm -hmm. yeah we actually agree with that and uh, Charlie Leroy I don't know if you want to uh, want to weigh in here yeah and uh, yeah exactly we do agree with that and and especially if we're going to expand the partnership that's an excellent opportunity to kind of open it all up and say okay what makes sense going forward what should the partnership look like what should be modified mm -hmm. and we think that it's uh, there's there are opportunities here in, in thinking about the years beyond 2015 to um, think reasonably creatively and and uh, you know, probably happily we don't have time to do that in the next two weeks, um, but I think that uh, that uh, there's there's definitely room for some creative thought on what a management structure might look like, what um, uh, how the partnership might evolve, and also how the management structure might might evolve, mm -hmm. possibly for some cost savings, to some uh, uh, increased efficiency, or just to focus it more on utilization. And um, you know, we we started uh, to to ask those questions, and it became very clear that in the time frame that we've that we've got, um, and the number of issues that we have to deal with, we just weren't going to get very far on that particular uh, particular area. Mm -hmm. But we we actually think that uh, should the station be extended, that that's a very important thing to uh, to follow up on. You want? I, let's see. I saw Jeff next, and then. Well, everybody, okay. <laughs> well, let, let me first note, this is actually the very first time that we've actually been able to start something like a discussion, because it's all supposed to happen in public. So you're seeing the sausage being made. Um, Scary. But you know, having said that, um, I love the idea of using ISS as an exploration platform. And uh, the pain of, of splashing ISS is obviously horrific to contemplate. But you know, if we extend ISS so that we can use it as a platform to get ready for exploration, we're using it to get ready for exploration, which we may no longer be able to afford to do. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the, the, we've been hearing for many weeks from a lot of dedicated people who have given years of their life to, to doing an exploration architecture, which you can sort of kind of maybe imagine if you sharpen your pencil very carefully, you might shoehorn into something. And then if you take $15 billion out of the top of that, it's just like game over. You know, yep. so is it get, granted that it's valuable? Is it is it that valuable? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I think I think that that's a that's a very fair question, and it's and it's exactly you know it's at the heart of what we're wrestling with, um, and uh, you know I just I think that with the investment that our country has made in the space station, and that by the way we have encouraged other countries to make. Uh, out of as significant portions of their entire space um, space budgets uh, to make that first of all um, you have to ask whether this is even our decision to make alone and you know I'm not sure that it is um, so clearly there's a, a broader discussion that needs to happen if in fact we do decide to, to deorbit ISS and then if we do decide to deorbit it because there's the next the next neat thing, um, exploration beyond it, um, then, you know, you have to step back and say, okay, so wait a second, let's, how did we get ourselves into all this? Well, we, we had Apollo and we had a Saturn V, which was a heavy lift launch vehicle, and we threw that away so that we could um, build the next cool thing, which at the time um, ended up being the space shuttle, which would then assemble a space station so the space shuttle has been used for now a very long time to, to assemble and develop this absolutely, actually unbelievable capability in low Earth orbit. And, okay, whew, got that built. Now let's uh, get rid of it and start something else. And, that, you know, that's just a, that's a, a philosophy that I don't, I don't like. 
Um, so if I were asked to make that trade today, which is an extremely painful trade to make because, you know, exploration is what, it's why I went into the space program, it's why Leroy went into the space program, it's why there is a space program, um, you know, it's, or it's why there's an astronaut office in the space program. Um, you know, if, if I were asked to make that trade today, I would really have trouble choosing exploration over the space station. And I hope it's one, I, I'm, I'm, Ed, we're leaving it to, to your <coughs> subgroup to, uh, to keep that from being a trade that we, that we have to make. Um, as a may, as a may panel, I, may I respond, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, since uh, you're under attack, we'll let you go first, and then no, we'll just no, uh, we'll work down this way. I, on the I table. think Dr. Wright has invited a response, uh, and and I will rise to it as a sort of loyal opposition <laughs> to reveal to the American people that we have not, in fact, come to any decision, but are genuinely debating this. Uh, I have in front of me the the task from the White House, which has four bullets, three of which are to expedite a new capability for the ISS. The second is to support missions to the moon and destinations beyond, and the third is to fit within the budget. And I think what we have revealed before us today is the beginning of the tension uh, reflected by this, uh, this charter to us and the wisdom of entrusting this, this problem, Norm, to you. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, act in a Solomon-like way and find a solution by the, uh, by the uh, end of the month, not even the end of the decade, as Kennedy gave us. But um, while the, the uh, arguments put forward by my colleagues, uh, each one of which individually is entire rational, entirely rational and sound, on um, uh, mass they propose a policy of continuation. And uh, it is always comfortable for organizations to propose continuation because it's what you do and what you know, what your stakeholders are engaged in. But the essential uh, policy of continuation which has been proposed is to take the two programs which have absorbed the uh, vast majority, if not all, of the human spaceflight budget of the nation for the last 20 to 40 years in the case of the shuttle and to extend them an additional five or parts of five years each. Uh, we don't propose the second. Well, for several, you have a proposal that goes and has several flights out into the period up to 14. Only in, oh, only in that's one. Only, that's only one. In one of the that, That's actually not our, well, I want to be not, clear, that's, that's, that's not, not our recommendation. We're, we're making no recommendation between you, our you, three shuttle scenarios. You have proposed just, options which go this far. We've, we've proposed three shuttle options just to span the trade space. We but are suggesting, however, among the ISS options, that the ISS continue in some form. But what this essentially does, in view of the understanding that we have, as Jeff started to, to get at, of the, of the fixed cost marginal cost structure, is that the effect of this would be to push off exploration probably within the fixed budget constraints by a not incommensurate amount of time so that the policy proposed by the President in 2004, uh, reaffirmed by the Congress in 2006 and 2008, uh, invited by the new President in, in 2009, would in fact not be implemented until well into the next decade. Uh, and uh, I think that this is something that really does reveal the fundamental tension that we're struggling with. And I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to pick a fight. Even though I'm I happy think that's why they put us so far away from each <laughs> other. <Yeah. laughs> You're on your but, other side. <laughs> but, but we do. But, but this is this is in some senses. And tomorrow we hear from Bo about just how easy or difficult this is in order to support from a launch vehicle uh, perspective. But it is a real difficult challenge. And I think once again, this is something that the committee has discussed. And actually, uh, Ed, you're you know you're not going to be surprised to hear that I um, actually agree with you. I mean, I think that that. Uh, um, our subgroup, you know, we had the shuttle and the station to look at. And we've, we've looked at them and we've come up with options on one and a point of view on the other. Um, but I think that what this is really revealing, uh, besides, you know, the, the difficult job that, that, you know, we've all got collectively to try to mesh what our subcommittees uh, are, are uh, uncovering, is that uh, uh, 
just as Norm said at the beginning, um, you know, NASA has traditionally been given uh, broad goals and inadequate funding. And you can't have, uh, you can't expect the agency to achieve uh, grand and glorious goals and not, if you're not going to give them the resources that are required to do it. And uh, if our group showed nothing else, we hope it showed that NASA has not been given the resources to support this vision that now two presidents have been supporting um, and that a Congress has been supporting. Uh, you know, these are the people that should be giving the agency the money, and the agency has not been given the money, and uh, we're looking at the result of that. So to try to fit a program into this budget that already isn't enough and to make it, you know, uh, more grand and glorious is um, almost falling into the same trap of saying, yeah, we really want to do something cool because, you know, we're, I mean, we all love this stuff and we, and, and we want to be doing cool things. So, you know, you give us 20 bucks and we can do anything. <laughs> Um, and, and so I think that part of our job is going to be to not let, um, uh, not let uh, the administration and Congress put NASA back in this box and to make it really clear that if you, want, um, if you want this program, you have to pay for this program. If you want this program, you have to pay for this program. And you can't cut the corners and start cutting back the costs even in the out years. Um, so. And, and just um, to show the agreement that we're violently in here, uh, I think, Norm, this is, uh, reflects on something the committee has discussed uh, in, in, in its subgroups, which is this, uh, what we've come to, to call NASA's uh, conundrum. This is sort of NASA's conundrum uh, at the highest level, which is that the agency really doesn't, in the current budgetary structure, have the, the resources to continue world-class, world-leading space program, and also de simultaneously develop the next step in a world-class, world-leading space program. And this is the tension, you know, in some senses, uh, my group has to examine uh, what we will do, uh, Sally has to examine what we are doing, and the, the two don't staple together inside the budget. Well, I think the thing that we have to do is be sure that we don't continue to choose the uh, uh, program for option A and the budget for option E. <laughs> there are two unstable poles in that system. Yeah, at least. Okay, okay. Let's see who's, who's next. Okay, well, it's your turn. Okay. Well, I love, I, I see the uh, value of ISS. It's a potential destination for growth of commercials. Wonderful. Uh, it's a wonderful test bed for international cooperation. And if we want to do some of the things we will hear from Ed, we will need to learn how to do that more. I hate destruction of a perfect asset. And I think we ought to think, I don't know if we can think all that big, but we ought to think bigger and, and paint some scenarios which involve usage of that asset. What I have a little bit of a problem with, with this at today for us to commit ourselves or declare before we heard from Ed is that we should make ISS as a part of every scenario. It's too early. We need to look at it as an integrated picture. Launch vehicles, ISS and SSP, and and ads beyond Leo scenarios, and then only then we can look at the integrated picture of these several scenarios and see how we can make or make not ISS fit into these scenarios. It's my opinion is too early today to to suggest that we should do every scenario which we haven't heard yet to say that ISS is part of each one of those. And, but I do actually, believe that we ought to have more than one scenario that does involve extension of that valuable asset for the reasons that 
We, we agree that uh, we don't want to, um, to make that decision today, but we wanted to get it out on the table today as our recommendation that it, that it be included in every scenario because I, I know that you, that, uh, you folks are doing thinking around budgets that are very likely in many cases already taking that assumed savings so that you can build larger programs. And so we want to have it in your minds as, you know, in the next uh, day and a half, <laughs> um, you know, as you're um, uh, getting ready to, to present your options of uh, certainly, number one, appreciating what you're doing if you, if you take that, that money for the exploration program and also begin to just think about, uh, you know, just expand your thinking a little bit now that you've had a chance to hear from us for uh, literally the first time on this particular uh, you know, this particular subject. So I think that that's, you know, as I said uh, at the beginning, our goal is to come out of this week of the, you know, kind of the discussions and the debate uh, with some um, decisions on what we've, what we've suggested and some, uh, some more integrated, uh, integrated approaches. Let me call on Chris, and then I think I'll, we've got one more no, I, just, I just wanted to add, to, add to what Sally's saying, and, and Bo, I don't disagree with what you're saying. And like Sally said, we wanted to get that out on the table because we have each independently and then collectively agreed that uh, uh, the benefits outweigh the, um, the uh, uh, disadvantages of keeping ISS around until at least 2020. Uh, but agree that as a committee it's too early to, to say, okay, we can't have any option paths stitched together that, that don't keep ISS. So, but what we have to realize is that we've heard very strongly from all the IPs uh, that if, uh, in, if in fact we end this in 2016, uh, they haven't come right out and said it, but I think we can forget about having international participation in exploration. Uh, okay, Chris and then Jeff, and then I'd like to wrap this up to keep us somewhere in our schedule because we want some public time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to give a set of reactions to the comments we've heard so far today and then ask a, a few questions. Um, I think I've heard five arguments so far for uh, extending ISS. And I characterize two of those as political, one as political with a strong technical component, and two as basically technical. Uh, the ones I find most impressive are the ones with a political component. Uh, the first is just this sort of fundamental absurdity of deorbiting a $60 billion investment five years after you finally get it operational. Uh, the second is the importance to our international partners and what that portends for our ability to engage them in future exploration, but also the possibility that this could be a useful model in the future international partnerships, although if we're going to use it that way, it actually has to somehow be extended to other areas of intergovernment cooperation. There has to be some thought given to how to do that. The, uh, the third argument, which I consider to be potentially extremely important, is encouraging the private sector to develop a variety of new ways uh, to have competition in getting cargo and then ultimately humans uh, to orbit, the COTS, the COTS encouragement that we've been talking about. Uh, if, in fact, um, station can be used that way, uh, then in fact extending, there's an argument, and I don't know where I come out on this yet because I don't understand it well enough, there's an argument that extending station in fact ultimately is an enabler for getting beyond low Earth orbit uh, because it would help us potentially solve NASA's chronic problem by, ha by relieving NASA of the need to get us to low Earth orbit, having the private sector fill in uh, what we know how to do, and then having NASA concentrate on the more ambitious type of exploration. So, in fact, I see the, a potential that, uh, that the argument for extending station cuts both ways with respect to uh, getting beyond low Earth orbit. And if it's the case, and we'll talk about this on Thursday, if it's the case that we can't get beyond low Earth orbit, even if we uh, send station into the ocean in 2016 in the budget that we're given, then uh, maybe what we need to think about is how we have to change the current paradigm a bit in order to, uh, to actually get to where we want to go, which is certainly out into the solar system. There were two technical arguments we've heard, and Norm's uh, question, both of them, I just want to circle back for a moment to them. One is the potential that we'll be doing important science on station uh, now that we finally can have a full crew complement on it. Uh, I'm open to that argument. Uh, what I want to make sure we do as a committee, though, is that if we make recommendations that they're highly credible. I don't want to go down the path again where we try to pretend 
uh, that we, where, where we make claims about the science that are going to be achieved on station, and the scientific community looks at it and it's a joke. Uh, there's an argument that I'm, I would very much like to hear uh, for the value of the science that will be done and whether it's worth the 10 to $14 billion investment that's going to be required to keep station flying. I'm open to that. But if it's not a major component, we shouldn't try to sell this extension on that grounds. Uh, I, just, I, I personally doubt that it's what sells the extension, but I'm, I'm open to that argument. Same thing for using it as a test bed. Another technical argument. If there's an honest technical argument to be made there, I'm very open to it, and I would love to see station be used that way. Uh, but again, I don't want a kind of vague overselling of station. Uh, I'd rather us be very clear about what it's good for and what it's not so good for. Um, so I'd like to hear at some point those two last technical arguments better articulated, more, more detailed arguments. And then finally, my, my last question has to do with shuttle extension. Um, and it's a question of whether there isn't some tension between really extending shuttle out to, Sally, I think you said 2014 in that scenario, um, and the importance of using station as uh, supporting the development of the private sector in servicing the station. If that's really an important reason for extending station, then do we undercut that by extending shuttle out to 2014? Yeah, I'm actually glad. Uh, I'll, I'll tackle the last one, and then uh, Leroy, Charlie, you want to uh, chime in on Chris's first question. Um, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that was that was something that uh, that we were hoping would surface as a, uh, a topic in this this discussion. Um, and again, let me let me emphasize that we don't really have a point of view on uh, shuttle extension um, between our three our three scenarios. But we do think that there's value in considering whether it should be extended in order to provide robust support for station. And our point of view is that um, that that need not and should not diminish the commitment to the COTS providers at all. There is plenty of up mass and a significant amount of down mass that you could uh, envision in a scenario of uh, robust support for station that the COTS providers uh, between now and, and 2014, they just can't provide. Uh, the the uh, HTV and ATV, we've got commitments for those already. I think it's one per year. Just look at our to scale chart and you can see how much mass uh, that gets, uh, gets up to station. Um, and then the COTS providers, uh, even assuming that they come in uh, on schedule and at the flight rate projected, uh, can't support a robust, um, it's not an expansion of station, it's a, uh, fully utilizing the capacity that's already up there. Uh, right now, with our current plans, we will not be using all the racks, for example, that are on station. I can't remember the percentage um, uh, occupation right now, but it's, it's at some place between 50 and 75 percent. I just can't remember the number, but we've got it, we've got it someplace. And unless you've got the additional transportation, you really can't fully utilize it. So, uh, you know, again, all these things are coupled. If you extend this, the shuttle, then the only reason to do it, um, and we want to make very clear that it, it should not, cannot, must not uh, compete with and take business away from the COTS providers. Um, it should only be used or should be used to make sure that we've got um, that we don't set up station to be, uh, you know, sort of a fragile asset, um, but that we rather give it robust support and use that capability to, to build its uh, utilization capacity, um, you know, to kind of get the throughput of up mass and down mass that's required to, to uh, get full utilization. Well, the cost providers are developing the capability to support it at a flight rate that, that uh, could continue that, uh, that robust nature of station. So it is definitely not our view that an extension of shuttle uh, would, should, or could uh, compete with the, the, the COTS providers. We're actually very optimistic. We would love, we also would love to see NASA get out of the business of, um, you know, the uh, first cargo resupply to, to station to low Earth orbit. Um, and then uh, eventually uh, human, uh, the human transportation to LEO. Jeff? Well, I couldn't have asked for a better segue because uh, 
you said one thing that I wanted to take strong issue with, which is that there's no way to pull in the gap, you know, before 2017. I don't think that's true. Um, I think that's a reflection of the reality that everything always takes longer and costs more, which is reality. Um, what it's not a reflection of is if you want to get to the end of the track faster, you put three horses on and you pick the fast one. Uh, you know, and we have in these emerging commercial providers the option of some alternatives that are cheap enough that we could actually afford to buy a couple of them and pick whichever one comes out faster. And does that guarantee that we're going to pull the gap in? No, it doesn't. But you know, you're really not talking about pulling the gap in. You're talking about assuming it will stretch out. And it, Are you talking about the? You're talking about the the, gap the crew. For the crew, yeah. As you know, if we, to if the, we turned on uh, cargo multiple issue. competing <laughs> crew providers, um, then it is my view no longer a certainty that they will all slip out past their projected initial operating capability by a lot. You know, some of them will, um, and we none of us is smart enough to predict who that will be. That's the whole point of having a competitive environment. But if you have a competitive environment, there's always a chance that at least one or two of them might actually do what they say. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, that's very true. And, and Bo's uh, group, uh, you know, has done some analysis of, you know, what, what they think might be reasonable for uh, all of the different possible options for low Earth orbit. Um, our, our, group, our group's job was not to look into those in detail, but to take a little bit of the, you know, kind of the bottom lines from Bo's group. And uh, when we said 2017, we were talking about Constellation, and I think I said that, you know, it, it, we thought that there might be some option to pull the gap to uh, by a year to a year and a half with, with other options. I'm skeptical about being able to close it beyond that, but I, oh, you know, I, I, I take I your point. I, I, I take your point. Yeah, so. But the, uh, the competition between shuttle and COTS that I was addressing was really the, the cargo resupply. Um, capability. So it's, we want to make it, make it really clear that our intent uh, in that would be for, for shuttle to support um, the, the part of the uh, cargo carrying that the COTS providers could not provide in that, uh, uh, the, next, the next few years, the next very few years. Um, and I know that, uh, do you want, uh, uh, Char looks like Charlie is, is ready to talk, talk to Chris's first, first question. Chris, uh, when you uh, raised your issue, doesn't shuttle extension uh, compete with COTS? That was my first reaction as well. That would not be a good thing. And uh, in particular, if uh, over the long run, the most robust uh, way of supporting science might in fact be to get the scientists to work with the commercial, uh, the commercial COTS uh, people for their for their access to space. And uh, so then, uh, just to repeat, the devil tree in Sally's proposal is all in the details. Uh, if, for example, what would you manifest on the 2013 flight? Will there be, yes, there will be empty racks. Will there be enough plausible experiments ready by 2013? What, what would you put on it? Uh, what would you put on such a uh, on such a flight uh, for shuttle for ISS extension and resupply purposes? And so, until I heard the answer to that, I couldn't um, I couldn't really come down very positively for Sally's suggestion, except that it might make sense from the gap point of view, the workforce point of view, if in fact there was a shuttle derived heavy lift vehicle on the horizon. And then you ought to study all these issues very carefully before you decide it. That was my, my point of view. So I was concerned that it would conflict with COTS. I think we better draw this particular discussion to a close. Uh, uh, Sally, when you and your team finished speaking, I thought I saw a path here. Uh, the, with the clarifying discussion, I'm not so sure I do. Uh, the, uh, the path I, th I thought I saw was to... Uh, fly out seven shuttles and to support the time it's likely to take to do that uh, in a reasonable risk environment, uh, to learn to live with a gap and to uh, uh, put uh, support ISS for another five years 
uh, primarily to support uh, future uh, uh, beyond LEO uh, flight activities. And uh, with the discussions, I think we've attacked each part of that uh, rather successfully. Uh, <laughs> And uh, we fortunately don't have to make a decision today, and these things have to match up, as several have pointed out. I think Bo was the first. that We've got to match these with the rest of the things we have to hear, and so we should probably wait to hear. But I would still like to keep that group of things kind of in front of everybody because uh, uh, we, as our options, uh, we can't just offer five blue plate specials. I mean, we've got to offer some affordable specials too. <laughs> 